Like what we're doing here at Cube for Two? Click the like and subscribe button to let us know. Also, Cube for Two is now a TCG Player affiliate. Click the link in the show notes for all your shopping needs to help support the channel. Alright guys, let's get started. What's good, Cubers? It's your boy Matt, and have I got a treat for you today. We have a special guest! Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to today's special guest. They're going to impart a lot of Cube knowledge. Here we go, introducing... So I am Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic the Gathering. Alright, so maybe I misled you just a little bit. Several years ago, Mark Rosewater gave a speech at GDC. That's a game developers conference, for those of you who don't know. I'm going to put a link in the show notes so that you can watch the whole thing. And he gives 20 different lessons that he's learned about magic over the last 20 years. And what I'm going to do today is we're going to pull some of his more interesting lessons that we can apply to Cube and to our Cube environments in order to make our draft experience and play experience better for our players. So... Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mark, and he's going to give us the first lesson. Take it away, Mark. Lesson number five. So for this one, we go back to Odyssey, back in September 2001. So in Magic, there's this idea called card advantage. Uh, It is a strategic thing that people learn as they get better at the game. So in... I'm doing a very abbreviated version of this for people who understand, actually understand card advantage. The idea is, if in my hand and in play, I have more cards than you have... Okay, then I, I have an advantage. If I have more cards than you, strategically I'm at an advantage. So we were doing Odyssey, and I said, okay, well, what if I could turn card advantage on its head? So, for example, there was a card called Patrol Hound, where you could discard a card from your hand to give it an ability. But it didn't matter. You didn't even care what it got. You didn't even want the ability. You just wanted to discard cards from your hand. Well, why would you want to do that? So there was a mechanic in the set called Threshold. And what Threshold said is, when you got seven cards in your graveyard things would change. So, for example, the Crows and Beast, which is a 1-1, became an 8-8. So the idea was, if you had seven cards in your hand, you could discard them all to the Patrol Hound to give your Crows and Beast and make it a 1-1 into an 8-8. How did that go over with the audience? <laughs> the problem was, yes, you could, you could make them do that, but they didn't want to do that. You know, instead of throwing away their entire hand, they'd rather, I don't know, play the cards in their hand. So it leads to lesson number five. Don't confuse interesting with fun. That's right. Don't confuse interesting with fun. I see this in new cubes especially, where they include cards that look interesting, but may not necessarily be fun. Let me go ahead and point out two examples for you. Sarah the Benevolent and Jace Memory Addict. Sarah the Benevolence minus six, her ultimate, is really easy to achieve. And in new cubes, they're particularly unbalanced. And so she looks interesting, but she's not necessarily fun. Her ultimate makes games drag on for a really long time, while the opponent searches for a board wipe so that they can try and make the Sarah player not have a creature, so then maybe they can end the game. Jace Memory Adept brings a similar mechanic to your cube with his zero ability. Target player puts the top 10 cards of his library into their graveyard. And what that means is that your opponent is basically on a three turn clock to answer Jace, and it's just not a fun way to win the game. It looks interesting on its surface. Wow, we're only playing with 40 card decks. That makes Jace a house, and it does. But a lot of times, because he's so hard to interact with, He just ends the game quickly for no reason, and it's not a fun play experience for your opponent. It's interesting, but it's not fun. As a matter of fact, that's going to connect us to one of Mark's next lessons. Go ahead, Mark. Hit him with the second lesson. Lesson number 12. Okay, so in the game, we have Planeswalkers. These are characters that cast magic, that duel with magic. You, the player, you're a Planeswalker. And we spend a lot of time and energy on these Planeswalkers. There are major characters in the story. In fact, we make cards out of them. And the Planeswalker cards are very popular. In fact, they're some of the most popular cards we make. Whenever we have a new set, people always ask about the new cards. So this story goes back to Avacyn Restored in May of 2012. We made a card called Tybalt. (laughs) 
So he was a devil planeswalker. They used like pain magic and a sharp dresser. Um, but we decided that he was only going to cost two mana. Because we had cards, we had four mana, three mana, six mana, five mana. We, we'd done all that. We'd never done a two mana planeswalker. Now, nothing about this being two mana serves the card or the character. We just wanted to see if we could do it. So what happened? One of the reasons people love planeswalkers is they're powerful. They're good. We tend to make our planeswalkers good. But by making it two mana, we didn't allow ourselves the ability to do that. And the reason they didn't like him was it just was weak because he cost two mana. So this brings us to lesson number 12. Don't design to prove you can do something. Don't design to prove that you can do something. I see this all the time in new cubes as well. I want to support dredge in my cube. I want to support infect in my cube. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can do it, but it doesn't mean that you should do something. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And it actually connects to our previous lesson, it's probably not fun either. What you're going to have to do in your cube is you're going to have to nuke a lot of stuff to support a parasitic archetype like Infect. You're going to have to have a lot of green pump spells, you're going to have to have Infect creatures in multiple colors that aren't good in other decks, and so yes, you can do it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it. And so that's another important takeaway. Just because you can do something in your cube doesn't necessarily mean it's something that your drafters are going to enjoy, right? This takes us back to, it might be interesting, but it's probably not fun. Speaking of fun, that takes us to another one of Mark's lessons. Go ahead, Mark, hit him with the third lesson. Lesson number 13. We go back to 2004, a set called Unhinged. So this was a humorous set, which broke a lot of rules that we never normally break. Because magic is often very competitive, and the product wanted to remind people the game can be fun. Magic can be fun. So we put a silver border on it to say, you can't even play these in tournaments. It's non-tournament legal. Okay, so in it, we had a mechanic called Gotcha. So here's how Gotcha worked. If this card was in your graveyard, if your opponent did a certain thing, this card, particularly if they said the word kill or destroy, which happened to be the name of the card, you could say Gotcha, and you could get it back from your graveyard. And there are all sorts of Gotcha effects. If they said a number, if they touched the table, if they flicked their cards, if they touched their face, if they laughed... If they laughed, you could say gotcha and get it back. So what, what was the best way to win this game? Well, don't talk, because you might say something. You know, don't interact, because you might do something. Don't do anything fun. You know, heaven forbid you laugh. Uh, so leads us to lesson number 13. Make the fun part also the correct strategy to win. Making sure fun is the correct strategy to win, for me, means making sure your cube is balanced. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's look at a pack one, pick one. So here's a random pack from my cube, except that I've changed one key card. Now there's a lot of fun strategies in this pack. Uh, White Wolf will tell you that Pack 1, Pick 1, Monastery Mentor is one of the best picks that you can make in Cube. Karn leaves us really, really open, and he's a lot of fun to play, and I have a drafter in my play group that slams Ophiomancer every single time they see them, no matter what. But the best strategy for winning in this pack is Mana Crypt. Mana Crypt is an obvious, you have to take this card first. This is the correct strategy for winning, but it doesn't afford players choice. It doesn't let them have fun the way that they would want to have fun. Instead, winning means Mana Crypt. And a lot of times, players will choose the winning strategy over the fun one. And so it's up to us as cube designers and curators to make sure that our cube is balanced so that the fun strategy is also the winning strategy. And I'm not saying that you can't play Mana Crypt. You can, you just have to do the other busted things too. Again, that's making sure that the winning strategy in a powered cube is also the fun strategy. But that takes us to our next lesson. Go ahead, Mark, hit him. We have gone. So this gets us to lesson 18. And if you follow my podcast or read my column, this is probably the one I'm most famous for. Restrictions breed creativity. So there's a myth about creativity that the more options available, the more creative people can be. But this actually contradicts how we know how most brains work. You see, the brain is an amazing organ. It's very smart. 
So when you're asked to solve a problem, it checks its data banks and it asks itself, have I solved this problem before? And if the answer is yes, it solves it in the exact same way. The exact same way. So what it does is it uses the same neural pathways and does exactly what you did before. Now, most of the time, this is efficient. It lets you avoid relearning tasks each time you do them. But it causes a problem with creative thought because if you use the same neural pathways, you get to the same answers. And with creativity, that's not your goal. So here's the trick I've learned. If you want to get your brain to get to new places, start from somewhere you've never started before. That's why each time I start a new expansion, I make sure to have a different vantage point. I always say, let's start this place from a set I've never started before. This has forced me to think in different ways and create new problems to solve, which results in new ideas and new solutions, which means that restrictions aren't an obstacle, but a valuable tool. So you can make use of restrictions to help you be more creative. Lesson 18, restrictions breed creativity. So once again, I can't stress enough. Having restrictions. In fact, if you don't have restrictions, make restrictions. Restrictions breed creativity. You can ban things for power in your cube. You can create restrictions on your drafters. Recently, I did this in my cube. Several months ago, I banned Mana Vault, Ancient Tomb, and Chrome mocks. I stopped the fast mana. And so what my drafters did is they started drafting to compensate. They started drafting earlier interaction. They started drafting more answers to aggro because they knew they couldn't outrace it. Restrict your players sometimes. It breeds creativity. Not only that, you don't just have to restrict your players inside of your own cube. There is actually another option in that you can have a second cube. I have a few cubes. We're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about how many cubes I've got. But, but you could have a backup cube with a different restriction on it. Most of us have a traditional legacy cube of some kind, but you could build a set cube that mimics retail draft. You could have a pauper cube that's all commons. You could have a powered cube just to really change things up. The traditional legacy cube, the uncube. You could do an extended block cube or a regular block cube. You could even build a peasant cube. There's so many options. And each of these options comes with a very different play style. It really mixes things up for your drafters. I like the idea of having a couple of cubes with different restrictions on them so that your drafters can have a different play experience every once in a while. Restrictions breed creativity and they create very different draft environments. Which allows me to send things back to Mark for the last lesson of today. Go ahead, Mark, take it away. Hit him with the last lesson. Okay, lesson number 20. So when you look up on the board, I started to realize that, for example, if I'm trying to make sure that I match human nature it's a little easier if my audience feels a sense of ownership because they're less inclined to feel like it's contradicting human nature. Or, for example, if I want them to... Uh, can't read it. Um, if I want them to understand the difference between... If I push them to make it more... Um, if I push it to make it more compelling and not boring, I'm more likely to make it something... Is that right? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm more likely to make sure that it's something that will be compelling to them. Um, or if I have them to explore, it's more likely that the details will matter because if they're exploring, they'll want to find the details and that makes them more interested in exploring. And what I found was, as you started connecting these different things, they all start coming together. Which is lesson number 20. All the lessons connect. In case you haven't noticed, all of these lessons connect. Making the fun strategy the right strategy not confusing interesting with fun don't design to prove you can do something restrictions breed creativity all of these lessons connect each one is related to the next i strongly encourage you to watch all of mark's game developer conference one it's really informative and you learn a lot of cool things about magic history especially for younger players and two you really can see how all these different elements of game design build on one another so that we can create solid environments for our drafters because cube is really about creating a fun experience for the other players at your table it's not just about you because if your players don't have fun you won't have players well that's gonna do it for today cubers i want to take a minute and just thank mark rosewater for taking time out of his busy schedule uh, to come hang out with us down here on the channel 
feel free to leave comments in the comments below if you've got questions or if there's other topics you'd like to see us cover or if you just like this kind of you know informative cube theory kind of video you can always catch me on twitter at cube for two like subscribe ring the little bell so you get notified whenever a new video drops and as always and until next time shuffle up and keep cubing my friends